to talk to you this morning a little bit about um, kind of where we're at individually, where we're at as a church, and of course where we're at as a nation. And so most of you know that four years ago I went through a period of time where I had a diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then I went through a period of chemotherapy treatment. That treatment stretched out about four months start to finish, and then there's a recovery time, and there was some uh, procedure predating, you know, the chemo. So all in all, it was about six months of my life was tied up. And during that period of time, um, you do a lot of praying. One, you are isolated. You are in a self-quarantine situation in the sense that your immune system is suppressed. You really don't want to be around anybody. Uh, and you might, you know, get set back in your recovery. And, uh, you know, it's really a time of seeking the Lord. It's a deepening experience. And I think that parallels where we're at as a nation. I think that's exactly where a lot of people are right now. They would define this time as a deepening experience. It's a time where we really think about what really matters in life, what doesn't matter in life. And um, when I was going through this experience, um, you listen to a lot of sermons, you listen to a lot of messages, and one of the messages I heard that really spoke to me was a minister made this statement, and he said this, sometimes when you go through a crisis, your first response is, how can I get out of this? In other words, the first response is, how do, how do I get out of this? For example, as a nation right now, how do we get out of this? How do we just fast forward to where we get on the other side of this situation and we move on with our life? But then he made this statement, and it was so true to where I was at at that time. He said, but then later you begin to ask yourself, what can I get out of this? What can I get out of this? In other words, instead of the focus being just, Lord, airlift me out of this situation, sometimes you realize, okay, I'm not going to get airlifted out of this situation. I'm going to walk through it, and I'm going to, God's going to preserve me through the situation like he did Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the fiery furnace. God preserved them through the situation. And the focus is, Lord, what can I get out of this? And when I heard the minister say that, I thought to myself, that's exactly where I'm at. And that is, Lord, what can I get out of this? And then that coupled with another scripture that I had heard a minister teach on many years ago from James chapter 1. And it says this, blessed, when you, when you face all different types of trials and temptation, count it all joy, knowing this, that the testing of your faith worketh patience. And this minister made this statement, and I'd heard this message probably 20 years ago. And he said, you know, in the Greek, W. E. Vines talks about one of the definitions of this word endureth temptation. It means a test that has a beneficial outcome. And when he said that, I thought to myself, now isn't that a powerful thought? A test that has a, a beneficial outcome. So what I want to get across to you, God's desire for this whole pandemic situation, COVID-19, this whole coronavirus, all of these terms that we've been introduced to and all these words that we've been introduced to over the past three months, you know, God's desire is not that we would just focus on, how do I get out of this? How do I get out of this? How do I get out of this? God's desire is that we would back up and we would begin to ask the Lord, what can I get out of this? Not just how do I go through this, but Lord, how do I grow through this? How do I become a better person on the other side of this storm? And then the Lord's desire is that we would all ask ourselves the question, how can this test have a beneficial outcome in my life? Now, I know right now there's a lot of talk, and, you know, the talk is, well, you know, this is the Chinese did this to us, and, you know, then there's other talk about all kinds of thoughts that go different direction. And you say, well, Pastor, where do you sit on all of that? I mean, kind of where, where is your position? I can only tell you what I saw in the dream or the vision that I had 
last month, and that was maybe the Chinese came up with a virus, maybe it was created in a laboratory, I don't know. Here's what I do know. What I saw, it was sin that opened the door for this to spread throughout America. So my focus is not on the Chinese. My focus, even though I have some honest questions about things, my focus is not on some other thing that's working behind the scene. My, based on the revelation I have, is just how can I, as a minister going forward, do more to educate people, the people that I minister to, to realize that the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, and then it says this, but sin is a reproach to any people. So just like you can take an individual, and if they live an amoral, immoral life, eventually that person may have some short-term gain, but in the long run, they're going down. It always happens that way. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, that way is death. So, you know, my position is to focus on the sin issue. My position is just to help us as individuals when we come through this to focus on what can we do as a local church family, what can we do as individuals to be more forthright, to be bolder, to be more frank, more outspoken on the subject of sin and that there are things that God blesses and according to the Bible, there are some things God curses. Now, I realize Jesus has been made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus took the curse of sin. But Jesus took the curse of sin for those that will look to him. In other words, for those that look to the Messiah, he became the curse. Whenever Moses lifted up the bronze and serpent in the wilderness, the Bible says that when the nation of Israel looked up at that serpent, they were healed of the snake bites they had received. And it's a picture of Jesus being lifted up and made sin for us that we could become righteous. The Amplified Version says everyone that looked at that bronze and serpent, the Amplified says this, with a steady and an, and an absorbing gaze. So they were looking to that serpent in the wilderness, and that's the parallel passage for John chapter 3, when we know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The background, or the backdrop of that passage is that just as Moses lifted the serpent up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Now, here's what I want to emphasize to you. How can we be better on the other side of this? What can we take from this experience? Because believe it or not, life's going to resume. It'll never be a completely normal back to where it was, but there'll be a new normal, and things will resume. And if it's like so much of the time when things do resume, if we're not careful, we can just forget about everything that's gone on. But that's not the plan of God. You know, I can say this. I believe there are more family devotions that have gone on in America over the past three or four weeks than have gone on in America in a very long, long time. I read recently, version said that Bible reading in the week leading up to Easter was up 54% from previous year. So in other words, you have more people engaged in reading God's word you have more families in prayer. You have more families joining together. And I do want to encourage parents, you are the number one discipler in your child's life. You're not going to be able to outsource that to a youth pastor. You're not going to be able to outsource that to a Bible teacher at a Christian school. Parents are the number one disciplers of their children. And what you have in you will be put into your child's life as you take words and build bridges. And by your example, you set the right example. So what are some things we can do? 
I mean, as a church family, what do we need to do so that we not, we not only get through this, but what can we take from this experience? Okay, I'm talking as a pastor now to our congregation. Church, we've got to be more honest about sin. We've got to make it real clear to the next generation. See, when I grew up, I knew certain things were wrong and I knew certain things were right. I knew that certain things agreed with the Bible and certain things disagreed with the Bible. And I understand that in our day that we're living in, sometimes there's been such a sin consciousness drilled into the hearts of people to where there had to be a correction to where we become more righteous conscious and we're more conscious of who we are in Christ. But on the same token, we live in a society that has shifted so far from the center and so far from what we call orthodox. The word orthodox means just upright. So when we call it orthodox Christianity, that's not a style of worship. That's just referring to what is upright and what is what the original intent is. And so whenever we talk about orthodoxy, what is upright, I think it's real important as a church, we've got to make the trumpet very clear We've got to make the message very clear, and we've got to be more clear today than we've ever been in our life. We've got to let people know, for example, abortion, it's wrong. That's just the way it is. Sanctity of life, sanctity of marriage, God honors heterosexual marriage. You say, well, Pastor, that, that, that's very controversial. God loves everybody in this world, but you understand God still has standards. And I think sometimes we're so concerned that if I say something that that's going to come off like I'm, I'm a directly attacking an individual. I love everyone. I care for everyone. But yet we can't so love to where we're not, we've, we're salt that has lost its savor. Does that make sense? What we need to do is be people that when we come through this storm, we realize, wait a minute, it was sin that brought this on America. I know you're going to still love me, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I think. I want to praise God that all the casinos have shut down in the state of Oklahoma. I know somebody say, oh, Pastor, those casinos, they're helping people out. They're paying for tuition. They're getting people all kinds of benefits. Hey, for every one success story, there's about 18 bad stories. And you say, Pastor, you're, you're going to become a clothesline preacher? Well, I don't think you have to harp on these things, but I think at times you at least need to let people know what looks right and what looks wrong. And you say, well, Pastor, do you even have an example? Yeah, I have an example, the Apostle Paul. He didn't just talk about the fruit of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul also talked about the works of the flesh, and if the truth be known, he actually talked about the works of the flesh before he ever addressed the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, Pastor, do you have any examples whenever, you know, there was some type of uh, hedge broken and judgment fell on people? Well, in Acts chapter 12, you had Herod that gave this big speech, and we're in the New Covenant and whenever the people heard his speech, they said, oh, this isn't the voice of a man. This is the voice of God. And boy, Herod loved all that. And the Bible says he fell over dead and he was eaten with worms. You say, Pastor, what exactly happened there? I don't know. We can ask the Lord when we get to heaven on that one. But do you understand the Bible tells us, behold, the goodness and the severity of our Lord. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, the fear of the Lord is a healthy thing. Fear of the Lord isn't fright, it's reverence. It's a healthy respect. It's honoring the laws of God. Now, really the way it works, church, God hasn't called the church Number one, to run out in the world and get in everybody's face and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. There is nowhere in Scripture you're going to find that. What you are going to find in 1 Peter chapter 4, where it says judgment begins 
at the house of God. So whenever God brings correction, whenever God brings change, you know where it starts? It starts right here in the church. In fact, Jesus, when he said, don't judge another person, in Matthew chapter 7, he says, before you go around trying to get the little splinter out of someone else's eye, you need to make sure you've got the beam out of your own eye. And how quick we are as the church to kind of take this sanctimonious attitude of, well, look at us, or I don't do this or that. But you see, here's the difference between, for example, the U.S. and every other nation in the world. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, he said, to whomsoever much is given, much is going to be required. There's not another nation on the world. We're 4% of the world's population. There's not another group of people on the world, 327 million people. No other country has had the gospel light that the United States has had. In other words, we have it Christian television. We're innovators in Christian television. We're innovators in Christian radio. We're innovators in podcast. You know, in other words, so many of the nations of the world look to the U.S. But the Bible says, to whomsoever much is given, much is going to be required. So it's imperative that we take account of our own lives. And what's God saying to you through this? You know, for example, parents, maybe through all of this, maybe the purpose of all of this was to cause a father to slow down and realize, I need to disciple my son or my daughter. Maybe the purpose of all this is to cause families to realize the best gift you can give your children is a healthy marriage. You say, oh, no, we don't have time to develop our marriage. We're trying to raise these kids. The best thing you can give your kids is a healthy marriage, the right example. Now, here's my concern. What happens if all of this storm blows over, all of it starts thinning out, which we believe it will, and I'm not just basing that on spiritual things, but if you look statistically, how many people are being hospitalized today versus how many were hospitalized three weeks ago? How many new cases? That was what you had to look at. Even though the death rate continues at times, but yet how many new diagnoses, how many new hospitalizations are taking place? Well, that's what you look at, that trend. But what happens when all of this comes to an end and a family looks at themselves and say, you know, we're really not any better off today than we were six weeks ago. We haven't done one thing in this home different today than we did six weeks ago. There hasn't been any more Bible reading. There hasn't been any more prayer time as a family. There hasn't been any more times where we've huddled up and we've joined together in prayer. You see, that's, I could be wrong, but I have to believe that part of the desire of God was by telling everybody to be safer at home. It's not that everybody can just get there in their home and go into their own world and isolate within the home, but I believe God's desire, certainly for Christian families, that we will come together and pray. And we've used this scripture so often, but it's still true. It's just as true this morning as it was when all of this started. When it started for us in Oklahoma City, it was March the 12th, whenever the NBA season was suspended. That was the tipping point, at least in Oklahoma City. But the thing I want you to see today is, is that 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people call by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Notice my people call by my name. There's not one reference to the world in that passage. There's no expectation in that passage of the world doing anything. It's my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. You say, well, wait a minute, time out, Pastor. I'm a believer. You telling me I can have wicked ways? In 1 John, John wrote, and he said, you know, he that doeth righteousness is righteous indeed. You see, by your deeds, by your works, by your fruit, Jesus said, you will be known. And then God goes on to say, then I will hear from heaven and then I will heal the land. So 
let's make sure that what's accomplished in your family and in your home gets accomplished. Let's make sure that you don't waste your quarantine. Say, oh, what what'd you get out of that quarantine? Well, I cleaned the garage up, and I got that closet cleaned out, and I got the yard cleaned out. I got all the flower beds taken care of. I mean, I'm glad you were able to do all that, but did you seek the Lord during the quarantine? Well, I had to because, see, there wasn't any NBA going on right now. There wasn't any baseball. That got canceled. Could it be God suspended all of this entertainment and all of these distractions so that we could put our attention on where it should have been all along, and that is on the Lord our God? So, don't waste your quarantine. So, I I started this message with a question. The focus is not, how do I get out of this? The focus is, what can I get out of this? How are you going to be different on the other side? You see, God wants this to be a deepening experience, deepening in the sense that we go deep. Yesterday, I was up and I was watching public television and they were visiting this nursery that grows trees. And uh, they were interviewing this lady that worked at this orchard and they were growing all these different types of trees. And as they were growing these trees, the lady made a comment, our only focus is on root development. We're just focused on taking care of the roots. If we can take care of the roots, the rest of it, a lot of our job is done. In other words, a lot of what else needs to take place, we can deal with the stuff above the soil. But if we can focus on the development of roots. Well, I just wonder how many times as parents we want to know what's my job What do I need to do? We're developing roots. We're wanting our children to develop below the surface. We want that part of their life that nobody else sees to be developed. And you say, oh, yeah, I want that for my kids. It starts with the parents. You can't give what you don't have. You can't impart something that is not imparted into your life. So one of the things we've got to do is make sure, how are you doing below the surface? Are you a public success, but you're a privately, you're a failure? What's going on in the inward life? What's going on behind the scenes? What is it that is really part of the internal makeup of your life? Is there sin? And, you know, the Scripture says if we will confess and forsake our sins, we will find mercy. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to confess them, we've got to forsake them, and we'll find mercy. But the Bible says if you cover them, you'll not, you're not going to prosper. And so as thoroughly as I believe we are the righteousness of God in Christ, as thoroughly as I believe that there is imputed righteousness in the name of Jesus, when you look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. All of that, all of those verbs are in the continual sense. In the original language, all of that is a picture of as you continually walk in God's will, as you continually walk in obedience, there is a cleansing of the blood of Jesus over your life. So it's imperative that we walk in the revealed and known will of God for our life, okay? So, what can we do different as a church congregation? I think we can make it more clear. I think we owe it to the next generation. And you say, Pastor, the generation, they know all these things. Pastor, they know all these things. Do you guys remember many years ago there was a minister, he passed away a few years ago, but his name was R.W. Schambach, okay? So R.W. Schambach was a man and he had a tent, and he would just travel. He'd go like to the Bronx, set up this tent, and have meetings. He would go where nobody else would go. He had a love for God, a love for people. And he would pray for the sick, and he would minister to people, and he would go in a lot of inner cities, set up this tent, and just have church and pray for people. Such a man of God. Well, one of the stories R.W. Schambach tells, he says that he was teaching one night, And he was talking about honoring God with your tithe. Tithe, T 
T-I-T-H-E. Honor God with your tithe. He was from Pennsylvania originally. And so, you know, he maybe had a little bit of an accent there, but he said, honor God with your tithe. Well, he said, you know, the next night, there was a man that come up to him, and he had a head. His hands were just full of neckties. And he started giving all these neckties to R.W. Shambach. Started, I have a gift. And Brother Shambach looked at him and goes, well, what, what are all these? Well, what are you doing? He said, well, you talked last night about honoring God with your tithes. And I just wanted to give them all to you, Pat, Reverend. I wanted to give you all the ties I, ties I got. Now, I know there's a lot of men out there that are going, Pastor, I will be bringing my ties to you next week, you know. But what I want to get across to you, we think people know what we're talking about. They don't know what we're talking about. I remember as a young pastor, I did a sermon one time, and I did a sermon on the, the word condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation. And then we'll either bow to him, Jesus, in adoration, or one day we'll bow to him and it'll be condemnation. Every knee will bow. You know, and I'm preaching about all of this. And after the service is over, I remember I was in the old, old what's our fellowship now, our first sanctuary. I went, I went in, this guy looked at me and stopped me. He goes, uh, yeah, pastor, can you, do, can you tell me what the word condemnation means? In other words, he didn't have the foggiest idea. You say, oh, pastor, you're just struggling real hard to come up with these stories. Well, I keep getting them as I'm telling you these. I got another guy one time came to church, raised in church, a traditional church. We call it evangelical churches versus non-evangelical. Evangelical just means, Billy Graham brought that word on the scene. It's a picture of people know they're saved. They, they know that they know they made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Well, this man was not from an evangelical church that the gospel was ever presented to him in a way that he had to respond to it. I got up and began to teach on Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas. And I remember he said he went home he opened the Bible and he said, I was so embarrassed. Here I was, a grown man in my late 40s, and I had no idea who Silas was. I'd heard about Paul, but I'd never heard about Silas. And he said, that really spoke to me that on some level I'm biblically illiterate. Now here's what I want to say. We have a whole generation of people living in the U.S., and they're biblically illiterate. Here's what God said about Jonah, the people in Nineveh. It said they don't know their one hand from another. They really don't know the basics. They don't know right from left. They don't know the, what we would consider the ABCs. And let me tell you, if the nation doesn't know the ABCs, if the nation is biblically illiterate, Guess who the teachers are? The teachers are the body of Christ. And if we're not making it real plain, if we're not making it real clear and real concise, woe be unto us. The Apostle Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. You know, I, I heard a minister say this, a minister who I respect and he was saying, you know, it seemed like there was a time that the church kind of got off track and there was so much uh, a focus on self-absorbed, their needs, what getting their own needs met, and there was just kind of this maybe an out of balance in those areas. But he says, here's what I feel like is happening in the church. He said, I feel like we have what I call a popularity gospel. The focus is totally on popular. In other words, if I do this, will the litmus test, will this be popular or unpopular? Will I get a like or a dislike? Will I get a thumbs up or would I get a thumbs down? And I want to remind you, John the Baptist, according to Jesus Christ, was the greatest preacher that ever preached. Jesus said that, you know, there's nobody ever been like John the Baptist. Of course, he had the greatest message. We understand part of why he said that. But I want to remind you, the greatest preacher that had ever lived was beheaded for the message that he preached. So what I want to get across to you today 
it wasn't a popular message, but it was the proper message. It wasn't, you know, the cool message, but it was the correct message. Church, we're not going to sub in coolness for correctness. We're not going to sub in what is acceptable for what's favorable to God. So how can we come out of this better? We got to let people know that the word of God is yes and amen, and we want to paint the vision. We want to write the vision and make it real clear so that those people that hear it can run with the vision. You say, oh, pastor, are you going to be a clothesline preacher? You know, I don't think we need to be a clothesline preacher because here's what I believe. I don't have to do the Holy Spirit's job, but I do need to teach the Bible. And here's what happens when you teach the Bible. The Holy Spirit begins to speak to people's hearts. I can remember a young man in church. And you know, there were times the Holy Spirit, I'm just hearing the word of God and the pastor's over here talking about this, but the Holy Spirit's dealing with me on this topic. But we can't take that truth and make it the only truth because if you read through the Gospels and you read particularly the epistles, the epistles is another word for letters to the churches, and we're still churches. We're a church just like they were a church. Paul didn't leave ambiguity about what's right and what's wrong. Paul made it clear. I'm not hurting you. I'm helping you. I'm not condemning you. I'm really edifying you. I'm helping you to know what is the right thing. So what's my motivation in this message? My motivation is, okay, let's not just get through this. Let's take something out of this. Let's, on the other side of this, become, you know, more refined. The Bible, the Bible says the word of God, here's what it says. It's like silver that's been through the furnace seven times. That's how pure the word of God is. In other words, what makes the word of God inerrant? What makes the word of God eternal? It's like it's been through the crucible. It's been through the furnace like silver, and it's been refined seven times. And, you know, when we go through difficult times, it's good to hold on to God's eternal word. Okay, now here's the second part of this message. First part is what can you take out of this experience? It's not for naught. It's not null and void. It's not like I went through all this, but the net, it was not a net positive or a net negative. It was just break even. That's not the intent of God. God wants us to be better. God wants us to be more, you know, intent on serving him. So the first part of this is we've got to have a more clear message, okay? We've got to have a clear message, and it starts with us, what we believe, and what truths we hold dear to us. Now, what's the second part of this message? What's the second part of what we need to realize? How can I come out of this better than I went into it before? You know what I think the Lord wants us to do? Let's just get rid of all the extraneous stuff. Let's get rid of all the fringe stuff. And let's realize one of the purposes or one of the things God, things that God allowed this to happen in our nation is that America could be reminded when they shut down every coliseum, when they shut down the arena, when they shut down the civic centers, when they shut down the concert halls, you're left with one thing. You're left with your family. You're left with people that are close to you. You know what God wants us to do? God wants us to focus on our family. God wants us to focus on the people that are close to us. Now, it doesn't, charity begins at home, but it doesn't end in your home. But yet, the scripture says, you know, that we should do good to all people, but especially the household of faith. So there is a priority. Now, when I went through this experience in 2016, in the middle of all this, the Lord really dealt in my heart that our family needed a break. We needed to do something. We needed to have a vacation. It had been a very intense time for Sharon. And um, I really wanted to do something special. And the Lord put it in my heart, take a vacation and go to Washington, D.C. So the, I think it was the first part of June of 2016, we all loaded up and we went to D.C. And um, it was a special time for me. It was a special time for our family. 
One night I got up early, and as I began to seek the Lord, I was like, Lord, okay, I've been through this season. I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to go and do this and that. I want this. And I was thinking about all these ministry things. And I'll always remember what the Lord said to me at that, that hotel in Arlington, Virginia. The Lord spoke to me that night, and he said one sentence. He said, your family needs you. That's what he said. Your family needs you. And I wrote it down, and I thought, wow, that's what the Lord's saying. In other words, more than the world needs me or the nation needs me or somebody else, the Lord said to me, your family needs you. Now, that was four years ago. I look back at that now, and I think, wow. When I look at the pictures of what our kids looked like four years ago and what they look like now, I go, wow, a lot has changed. I think about we have a son that's graduating from high school next month. And I think to myself, I'm not getting those years back the last four years. That would have been all of his high school experience. Now, I'm going to tell you, parents, bloom where you're planted. Be where your feet are. Be in the season that you're in now. One day I was talking with our son Luke and I was talking about just good memories and it was right before he went to sleep he's 18 now and I was in his room and uh, you know I was really getting emotional because I knew he's gonna be going to school and I was just thinking about all the great memories we have and he's in the same room you know since all his life and you know I was just thinking of that and when I walked down the hall back to our bedroom I heard the Lord speak to me one word and he said, season. You've got to live in the seed. You can't go back to the season four seasons ago. You can't go back to what it was like four years ago. Tom, you've got to live in the season that you're in right now. Now, right now, we're in the spring season. It may not feel like it, but we're in the springtime. Well, you know, people dress suitable to the season that they're in. And you see, you've got to realize there are seasons of your life that you'll never get back. Now, God can redeem the time. God can do something about that. And this is not a message of condemnation because I realize there's people going, wow, I wish this or I wish that. Forget about that. You still have today. And you have something profound and something impactful. Let me tell you, when God gives people messages, it's never to put heavy on them. It's to get heavy off of them. Does that make sense? In other words, when God gives you a message and you have a teachable spirit and you have an honest heart, God's not giving you a message to drill you in the ground. God's giving you a message to encourage you. And so I don't in any way want people to feel condemned in this situation. But here's what, you don't have the past, you don't have the future, but you have today. You have the season that you're in now. So when the Lord spoke to me that word, your family needs you, I heard that. Now, I think that word is not just customized. Tom Arnold, your family needs you, but nobody else in America, their family, you know, I think it's a universal word. I think it fits all of us. See, on some level, I'm replaceable as a pastor. And here's the truth of the matter. Most of the time, your replacement does a better job than you do, okay? I'm replaceable as a pastor. I'm replaceable on so many different levels. But, you know, there's one area that it's kind of hard to replace and that's a parental role. Now, I'm not saying God can't use somebody else to step in as a step parent, and, and I know that happens. But I think sometimes you can raise your kids because, see, so much of what you're correcting is a little chunk of you that's in them. You know why they act that way because, see, they're your, they're your child, and you can see a part of your own reaction. So what can we take out of this experience? Your family needs you. Okay, now I'm going to give you a little revelation. Oklahoma City, Thunder fans, your family needs you more than the Thunder needs you. Okay, I got another little revelation. I'm on a roll here, all right? All of those, you Sooner fans, your family needs you more than the Sooners need you. They'll be fine. 
Trust me, they will be fine. Oklahoma State, I got to put Oklahoma State in there. The Cowboys, right? Go Pokes. You know, did you know God wants you to know your family needs you more than Mike Gundy needs you? Now, why do I say these things? Because sometimes we get strung out, we get put in a priority on all these things that are out there, but you see, our family's important. Here's what Jesus said about the home. In Matthew chapter 12, he said, a house that is divided against itself is not going to stand. So the devil's goal is to split your family up. The devil's goal is to split the marriage up. The devil's goal is for mom to have a favorite with this child and dad to have a favorite with this child. That's not the will of God. How many know with God, we're all his favorite? And we need to love and love unconditionally. So what can we take out of this? All the extraneous stuff is gone. All the fringe stuff is gone. Let's make sure we focus on the family. Let's make sure we put a priority on what's really important. And our family's important. So I want to say to you today, there's a third part to this. And you know what else we can take from all this experience? One is we need to have a real clear message. One is we need to focus on the family. And then here's a third, third thing I want to say. We need to value the local church. You see, it's been through all this time that I've realized, thank God for a church family. Thank God people come to me, Pastor, I'd like to give this gift. Is there anybody I can go take groceries to? Pastor, I, I have a donation here. Is there somebody we can help? You know, as a church, us, Sharon and I, being conscious of one missionary family in particular that we know has been impacted by this, and just we want to be alert. You see, God's best is for every person in the United States of America, and I could say the world, but let's just zero, let's just focus on the U.S. God's desire is that every person in the United States of America would be a part of a church family. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought it's God's desire they'd be born again. Yes, he wants them born again. But he doesn't just want them born again and then hanging out doing their own thing. God's desire for every individual in the United States is that they would have a church home. And you say, Pastor, why is that? Your quality of life is better when you're plugged into a church family. You see, sheep are most content when they're a part of a sheepfold. And what I want to get across to you this morning is, and the final part of this message is this, God's desire is that you would be plugged into a church family. What can we take from this experience? The value of church. But I want to give you a little something that I believe with all my heart is the truth. You know, there are things that we have implemented as a church over the past month that are going to stay in place even after this storm moves on. And guess what? We're going to be stronger than we've ever been. We're going to reach more people. In fact, we already are reaching more people. But God's ultimate desire is to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And I know on some level we're assembling through all of us here in the word together. But there's a difference whenever you get everybody in one place, in one accord, like it was in the book of Acts, the original birthplace of the church. You think about that. They were all together in one place, in one accord, and the Holy Spirit fell. Iron sharpens iron. You need fellowship with other believers. So today, I love you. I care about you. I care about our church family. And my desire, in a nutshell, is not just that we're all so focused on when are we going to get out of this, that nobody's asking the question, what can we get out of this? What can you get out of this? How can your marriage be different? How can your parenting style be different? Maybe God wants us to drop it into low gear and prioritize some things. I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for the Bible. I thank you for the word of God. 
I thank you for our church family. Lord, I pray that our message would be more clear. I pray that our focus would be on a family, our families. And I pray, Father God, that we would value the church. What can we get out of this? That's my desire. If you're at home right now, I'm talking to you. What can you get out of this? What can you get out of this? You see, if we go through it, it's all for naught if we don't make change. And as I said last week, the people say, oh, the virus will determine when this is over. The business community says, no, the economy will determine when this is over. And God says, neither one of you are right. The church will determine when this is over because it's the church that needs to pray and seek God and we're the ones that turn the tide. Praise God. Now, I know there are people that are watching me today that are a part of our church family, but I recognize there are other people. You're not a part of a church home. Maybe somebody invited you to watch this program. And you know what you need to do? You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. I recognize there's some people, maybe as a child you were raised in church and then you've kind of gotten off to doing your own thing. You're living in a way that doesn't honor God. You've drifted very far from God's will for your life. You know what, God, he loves you like you are. Exact, he loves you just like you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay there. And so today what I want to do is I want to give you an invitation. I want to give you an invitation to come to the Lord. And you say, well, Pastor, how can I be saved? How can I have the absolute assurance that every sin is forgiven and that I have eternal life? It all hinges on one thing, and that is, what do you do with Jesus Christ? You need to invite him now to be your personal Lord and Savior. You say, well, Pastor, I did that many years ago. I've already done that. But you see, you know him as a Savior, but you're not acknowledging, acknowledging him as your Lord if you want to have fellowship, there needs to be lordship. And that is, you say, Jesus, every area of my life, I surrender it to you. So I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer. It's a very simple prayer. And it's just saying yes to Jesus. I want you to just say, dear Lord God, I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. Just say that. I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead, and I believe he's alive today. Therefore, I accept his forgiveness. I accept eternal life, and I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. See, that's the beginning point. You know, there's others that are watching this and you say, Pastor, now I prayed that prayer before, but I, you know, I'm just not, I'm not plugged into a church. You'll grow spiritually when you're plugged into a church. 